So it's been, it's been a while since I thought about the human in its inner kind of like, um, and what I'm going to talk about today is really to think about how the human might be a category sort of distraction and the ways in which kind of category distractions often kind of set the term in all sorts of uh, kind of unconscious and material ways for the type of politics that gets to enter the scene. Um, so the argument I want to make today is really that the human might appear as this kind of subjective figure of capitalism, late capitalism, but it binds us to a political subjectivity and the kind of judicial end games of liberal representation and impossibility. But really its groundings are in the inhuman, inhumane subjugation of colonialism and that terraforming of the earth. Quite simply that the Anthropocene names the kind of, the end game of colonial earth in a sense. Um, but if we want to kind of engage in a sense with um, these material underpinnings, um, there's a kind of different spectre that's released into the scene by the Anthropocene, and that's of a kind of lithic subjectivity and geologic relations that are the kind of very ground on which these kind of discursive uh, constructions gain their power as what we might term as geopower. So in this talk, I want to address how this kind of lithic rather than political or economic account of the subject might open up new considerations of the site of politics and address the tight colonial bonds between racialized subjugation and extraction. And also, I, just, I don't want to just kind of address uh, subjugation, but think about some of the broader implications between the bonds between populism and extractive economies, uh, and also the kind of liberatory potential of thinking with the inhuman, uh, not as a kind of perverse kind of engagement, but really as a kind of sincere uh, sort of testament to um, the forms of solidarity and kind of theorizing that have taken place at that kind of junction between the inhuman and the inhumane. So historically, if we think about political subjectivity um, as um, a kind of stratal effect that is defined by stratigraphic hierarchical imaginations of the human and the earth, um, rather than the kind of human and its racialized subhuman inhuman designations, they're always sort of designated in a biocentric mode. Uh, and this is really what I want to get at, is what is at stake in this kind of split of bios and geos and its reproduction um, through extractive economies. So that if, if we kind of think outside that the human and the divisions between the sort of bios and geos that it brings into play, um, how might a kind of politics be differently understood um, that is not kind of predating on that um, rift in the fabric of being, okay? So what does it mean to have rocks in the family? And how do we talk of a genealogy that allows us to think with rocks in the family, not just non-humans and other kinds of forms um, of life that reinforce a biocentric mode? So the emergence of geosocial forms not governed by the skewed arrangements of political subjectivity as they're defined by liberal humanism is a reorientation of collectives and possibilities of non-lethal conditions. It's a vision of solidarity across marginalized forms that releases rather than reinforces racialized terms. So it's about thinking about how we don't reinvest in the very terms that have been the kind of um, underpinning sort of material grounds of subjugation. So if we engage the human in critique, it immediately pulls us into this kind of dialectic of the not and its hierarchical segregation of gradations of value and as they are kind of understood as differentiating from the ideal type of heteropatriarchal whiteness. We do not need to reiterate this very well-made point, right? The human has kind of is, is gone through its uh, machinations. But what is at stake, I would argue, in this framing is also the materiality of subjectification and the mattering of um, the kind of forms of oppression um, that we are talking about today. So the human holds us to this biocentric narrative that sediments and concretizes around kind of its violent accruals around certain subjects and not others. 
And even as it might be critiqued and narrated in a defiant humanism, and I'm thinking here of the work of uh, the Caribbean scholars, Edouard Glisson uh, and Sylvia Winter, but the humanist deficits have a doubling effect while stabilizing the ideal type through the migration of margins, even as it petitions on kind of bringing down those elevated forms and broadening its ecological attachments and obligations, thinking here in the work of Winter. So if we look at the geography of the human, um, that we must kind of acknowledge um, and in this moment we are uh, in, in ecological relations, of the kind of need of certain material relations to survive. So by paying attention to the figure or the figuration of the inhuman and its racializing twin of the inhumane, two possibilities exist to decenter the human and thus whiteness and to put the most marginalized at the center of an obligated analysis. So secondly, we can, if we put forward a materialist un understanding of subjectivity that is kind of proto-bios, so kind of what is it that allows the bios of the human to emerge as such, and located in understandings of geos as the ground of this formation, this does not explicitly carry forward this bio-geos split, split, which is the very basis of extraction. And it's the very basis of an extraction that allows capitalism to emerge historically. And with it comes its preferred forms and its modes of predation that mobilize between the inhuman and the human. So if we note that this bio split that underpins the geologics of racial capitalism and propels its futurity uh, of an infrastructure of effects, so extraction carries this predation and uh, uh, mobilization of racialized undergrounds, even without a human. So um, we can think about that as kind of um, the very basis of racialized forms of extraction, uh, extraction that extend into kind of all forms of life, of psychic life, and um, the kind of possibilities of life to exist at all. So if we think about this in human also in its liberatory solidarities, rather than subjugating modes, uh, or at least alongside those subjugating modes, it's a way to make and develop a politics of stratal solidarities against the oppressive use of geopower in the configuration of subjective life as both carceral and coercive. So we can think here about something like No Dapple, um, the kind of indigenous uh, refrain of water is life, as such an example that refuses the reproductive geologies of kind of racial capitalism. So I want to be kind of very clear on this point. I'm not suggesting that we mine the kind of enforced precarities of subjective or subjugating geologic relations for some redemptive narrative. So this is not turning to the inhuman to get a better narrative of kind of geologic relations. Um, but a way to think about and make and develop a politics of stratal solidarities against this oppressive uh, use of geopower. Uh, and to think about the ways in which race is used uh, in, um, and to speak against the ways in which race is used um, as a proxy for environmental harm. So often in kind of the environmental literatures, race becomes, it, it's named as the proxy for um, kind of forms of kind of pollution and environmental harm. Or there's the kind of um, social justice discourses that petition on this kind of uh, sphere of improvement. Um, so if we move against both of those kind of redemptive narratives, um, but still hold with the understanding that a proximity to the earth and its violences is also a space of negotiation um, for the redress and re, uh, re kind of reparations um, of material relations. So we could call this a kind of politics of geoethics, uh, bracketing out the problematics with ethics, but that's how I would talk with my kind of geoscience colleagues about this, as a way to think about kind of reparations, racial reparations through um, geologic uh, sites. But also to acknowledge that this kind of proximity to the inhuman is a site of knowledge production and theorizing, and more on that later in terms of black studies. 
So while various theories have proceeded with dis dismantling this kind of nature-culture binary, they've often left the bios-geos uh, boundary intact. And I would argue that this is because the cost for that disaggregation uh, of the kind of, of nature culture does not involve dismantling whiteness. So the reluctance to engage with the inorganic organic binary or the inhumanities as we might term it uh, on which the humanities is raised is much less attended to in social theory because it requires the end of white supremacy. So speculative materialisms have bypassed the racial terms of materialism and declare themselves in a kind of non-declaration as post-racial, as with or without a subject. So we see the proliferation of entanglements with non-humanists, uh, non-humans in feminist materialists and STS, but the engagement with race is much less common and welcome, it seems, as one can seemingly proceed as if this is not necessary. So the racialized bias of the earth and its coming into being as the Anthropos, as kind of colonial earth um, that the Anthropocene declares is a different modality of encounter within human uh, that can no longer kind of secure itself uh, through a philosophical outside. So these inhuman intimacies between race, matter, and space are the very bedrock of the inhumanities, um, a parallel paraontological site, to use Nam Chandler's term, to the development of the humanities and their material economies um, forged under colonialism as kind of cartography, figure, discourse, praxis, and institutions. And this is why I'm interested in thinking about what institutions of the inhumanities might actually look like. Uh, what would it mean to take over the uh, Institute of Humanities and center that on this kind of inhumane, uh, inhuman uh, axis? So subjective inclusion on the side of inhuman materiality and the intimate forms of exchange and valuation with inhuman materials that results from this historical emplacement means that race makes manifest material bonds that mobilize across inhuman materials and geologic subjectivities. As a desire for inhuman, material, inhuman materials mobilizes and maintains racial dynamics such as settler colonialism which is to say race is deeply implicated in the experience of the inhuman world, materially and metaphysically, affecting geophysical states of being. And I, when I talk about geophysical states here, I'm not talking about in terms of metaphor, I'm talking about anti-gravities as being produced as material effects uh, in the production of space. Uh, and I think the kind of theoretical claim of Black Lives Matter is a very material claim uh, on these uh, and theorizing of this uh, state of anti-black gravities. So thus, in human materialities, mobilizes longitudinal forms of valuation and devaluation as they simultaneously transform Earth systems and processes, making the inhuman a site of radical redress and revaluation, where debt is inverted and uh, Quote Glisson, poverty is ignorance of the earth. In human proximity, often without consent, petitions on the intimate recesses of subjective relation, but it also opens out into a cosmic expanse that far exceeds these coercive geopowers. And I think that's what people like Glisson really recognize is the kind of potential of a kind of cosmic materialism. The effects of humanity's material economy and its partial categorizations remain robust in stratified forms of life as bios, even as political states shifted and were reinvented through the liberation struggles and post-colonial movements. So while it's clear why post-colonial writers such as Glisson, Césaire, and Winter engaged the human to open its doors to the fullness of the world in the context of having to live in the narrowness of its partial inclusions, the optimism of that opening as a restructuring epistemology had limitations. Liberation from colonial powers did not bring the imagined freedom from the effectual architectures of extraction under post-colonialism. If the human is indeed a ruse and a distraction, a petition on the unpartitionable, then the real work might go into the category of the inhuman, as both the ground of the human and as partaking of the forces of the earth. So as a way to disrupt the weaponization of geopower or the weaponization of materiality through kind of uh, the harnessing of geopowers. 
And it's precisely because if we engage with this notion of kind of um, of the inhuman, that we begin to see the kind of proto conditions on which every kind of act of capitalization um, it sort of invests itself. So, inhuman intimacy is a way to rethink the relation of race and earth in less devastating forms and to pay attention and recenter the emergent communities that allied kind of these normative structures of materialism. In human affinity across many cultures and attachments precede colonialism and, it's, and are contigu contiguous with it. Affinities, however, do become rifted under the weight of colonial investment in the castoral terms of personhood that are enacted in that category proximity to the inhuman um, of the inhumane. So the ontological category of the slave, for example, as inhuman property, indigenous genocide as a means to resource. That these are, these are fundamental terms that actually implot um, a, what I call kind of white geology. So materializing and maintaining other earths is conversant with a normative drive to consolidate colonial earth and its domination of the architectures of the future. So these kind of... Um, resistances to the normative drive um, and the kind of maintenance of other earths are crucial to the possibility and the kind of non-normative um, modes of survival within the domains of colonial uh, earth. So although non-consensual intimacy with the inhuman did not overwrite other affiliations, the inhuman affinity is not the sum of its most negative organization. Attention to the inhuman as a category of subject and earth effects is a route into the abolition of the human and its policing of the permissible figures of attachment across care between human, non-human, and inhuman worlds. So what I'm suggesting here is not necessarily a new directive as such, but a kind of shift from the metaphysical terms of the human and also kind of the explanation of its political instantiation to geophysical substantiation that uncovers a different dynamic of what is possible and what is at stake. I argue that metaphysics is constructed via geophysics, via this kind of biogeos split, depending, and you know, different people get caught on different sides of the biogeos split. Um, and it holds that geophysics is a space to undo racial metaphysics and the material infrastructures that maintain the organization of race as a kind of surface presentation um, of these kind of um, geological uh, relations. So rather than seeing inhuman intimacy as solely the result of subjugating relations, if we push further into those intimacies, we recognize that these are the kind of ongoing resistances um, within these um, kind of intimacies are ongoing resistances to that positioning and the, the kind of invent, inventive refiguring of those intimacies within carceral conditions, um, but also the kind of sites of imaginations and practices beyond them. So any kind of mining of the liminal kind of creativity uh, of subjugation is understandably a raw question, and this is not what I'm suggesting here. Um, but in the context of white institutions and their predatory forms of extraction, I do want to argue for a lithic account of subjectivity that opens the construction site of the material context of oppression to new insights that move beyond these kind of judicial endgames of liberal representation and the complete impossibility of that for certain subjects. So in terms of methods, there's a need to resist epistemi uh, epistemologies of extraction that grammar political forms and saturate language. Um, and here I think there is a real need for a kind of promiscuous interdisciplinarity that disrupts the stabilization of uh, colonial geologics, which puts kind of geos over here and bios over here, and also does the same with political subjectivity, right? So this is what we're, the kind of work that we're all involved in is actually, you know, a lot of it is trying to join up these narratives across these separated domains. So this gathering could be called the Inhumanities, a counter-conceptualization of the geohumanities in the context of the Anthropocene, the foregrounds the role of the inhuman as it's kind of established through in a kind of epistemology of colonial earth. Winter has made the point that humanism is a selective um, displacement of who can function as a political subject. 
It's my contention that the functioning of subjectivity is equally fashioned in the realm of geology as a temporal ground that subtends biological racisms and the actual earth that's been extracted beneath our feet, albeit differently. So as environmental concern and the designation of the in, uh, Anthropocene foster new interdisciplinary configurations in the humanities that are often underpinned, underpinned by targeted funding mm. to organize responses to environmental and extinction crises, the human often gets taken for granted, obviously not at this conference, as this kind of accomplice in the designation of a field of concern, as the planet is taken as the presumed area of action. While climate change and mass transformation of the planetary geochemical system do in call, indeed call for a new understanding of the commons beyond geopolitical configurations of the founding of colonial states, such as modes of existence, such modes of existence need scrutiny for how they mobilize geophysical changes of states. So we might think about politics, not just in its sort of change of state uh, in political and economic terms, but as its change of state in geophysical terms, right? So politics, you know, as we're seeing kind of played out at the moment um, in terms of kind of uh, new forms of imperialism and um, populism. Uh, they're all underpinned by geophysical states, right? That's what allows the state to come into being. Um, so if we're going to make kind of, um, you know, if we're going to make sort of new claims um, about um, a kind of a, a form of humanism to take us through these um, kind of uh, rifted grounds, uh, I would suggest that ordering, thinking about the ordering of the kind of human uh, might actually distract us from the very material operations that kind of uh, extract and control the earth and racialize its uh, populations since kind of, uh, you know, particularly in the 17th, 18th century um, uh, paleontology, but since sort of 1492. So in the rush to secure white settler futurity, the environmental humanities has often assumed rather than problematized this human uh, that kind of secures the uh, concept of the humanities at the same time that we'll in the humanities feel under attack by other forces, that there's this kind of, there's this, you know, a, a, a desire to actually kind of put forward the, the, the humanities uh, in its kind of usefulness. Um, so if we think about the ways in which kind of um, capitalism uh, names a set of uh, systems, of economic systems, um, we might also think about what is the kind of the sort of before the capitalist scene, what is the very thing that allows capitalism to come into being. Um, and I, I just want to read out uh, Sylvia Winter's rebuke to the sort of prior conditions of production because I think it, it's also a rebuke to this kind of notion of a capitalist scene. And she says, it's not primarily the mode of production capitalism that controls us, although it controls us at an overtly empirical level through the institution of the free market system and everyday practices of its economic system. But you see, for those to function, the process of their functioning must be discursively instituted, regulated, and at the same time, normalized and leg legitimated. So what I'm going to suggest is that what institutes, regulates, normalizes, and legitimates what then controls us is instead the economic conception of the human man that is produced by the disciplinary discourses of our now planetary system of academia as the first purely secular and operational public identity in human history. In order to be unified in economic terms, we have to first produce an economic conception of being human. This is why however much abundance we can produce, we cannot solve the problem of poverty and hunger. Since the goal of our mode of production is not production for human beings in general, it's to provide the material conditions of existence for the production and reproduction of our present conception of being human. To secure the well-being, therefore, of those of us, the global middle classes, who have managed to attain its ethno-class criteria. 
So here we might kind of think with Winter, but also kind of depart from her thoughts around kind of homo economics as historically being the kind of enabler um, to think really about what I'm asking for here is an arrangement of geologic life that allows this kind of economic uh, version of the kind of prioritized human to come into being. And you know, whether we use that as kind of the life with a capital L or kind of bios or um, the human. So while we've got this kind of pressure being put on the figure of the human, it's her herosticity, it's racialized and gendered and sexualized forms, it's not necessarily hermeneutics of the human that's needed. So we can go from colonial man to Anthropocene man, from master subject man to master subject anthropos, for example. But the ground on which these conceptions are kind of made materially uh, and psychically and economically need an unearthing. So it's the very kind of material constitutions of those figures of thought um, that we can begin to kind of explicate through an examination of the geologies of race. So the material incorporation of the European subject and its settler colonial kin in terms of value accumulation and subjective forms were defined against what was classified as fossil nature, indigeneity, fossil energy, the enslaved and now a blackened strata of extractive workers to transform the ecological and energetic organization of the world. So these were kind of prima facta kind of geologic relations as much as kind of a set of uh, race is what allows those geologic uh, relations to remain in place. Through the regulation of kind of biological or racial relations, the geologic kind of extraction and the kind of organization of racial undergrounds uh, is maintained. And I would argue it's continued to be ma maintained in neo-colonial extractive economies. So as the Anthropocene empirically describes a new film, field of geologically informed power relations that focus attention on the geographies of the inhuman, geologic forces and the politics of non-life, it also represents an explicit formation of political geology that is racialized from its onset in the geologies of colonialism or white geology. So um, if we think about the kind of inhumanities as a means to reconceptualize and challenge these existing disciplinary approaches of the humanities, um, in doing so, we're acknowledging uh, that's that which is erased in the collaborative junctures between metaphysic, metaphysical de designations of the human and the geophysical praxis that brings subjective forms materially into being and also the way in which that subjectivity is shared across geologic relations as a body shares geology. So this is where, what I'm getting at in terms of like having a rock in the family. Like what, what actual kind of conceptual language do we need to develop in order to make that a possibility? So this geologic practice refers both to the extraction of natural and psychic resources for the maintenance of white heteropatriarchy and how it materially regulates racist, racist structures of extraction and subjugation. So in the Anthropocene, the, of, the human often comes into view organized around a telos of the coming catastrophe of various ends. And then we have the kind of search for beginnings and origin stories that kind of in some way change the end of that story. So if we kind of think rather alongside, um, rather than this sort of end games, um, we think alongside the kind of post-colonial thinkers such as Fanon, Glissant, Césaire. Um, I think where the, what they really understand in, in, in their writings is the kind of the site at which meaning gets made and unmade. And Fanon's kind of uh, decolonizing track, The Wretched of the Earth, um, it's kind of one of the forms of that, why we think, think of as a kind of subterranean theorizing um, that we see again in the kind of black radical condition, uh, tradition and black Marxism and so on. But a real kind of examination of the ground and grounding of, in, uh, of humanism and a kind of, you know, a, a statement on the anti-black um, ground of that production. So I think kind of uh, one of the ways in which uh, we might think about this kind of black radical tradition is also in its theorizing of a non-normative materiality. 
So like, it's been essential and kind of to theorize alongside the kind of production of how to get into that uh, designated class of the human, uh, kind of an understanding of the material conditions of subjugation and possibility. Um, so if we think about, you know, if we think about one of the most dominant kind of ways in which um, the earth is organized materially, it's through the normative production and language of natural resources, right? So natural resources uh, that kind of like taken for granted, you know, globally shared normative language around what to do with the earth or the relation, you know, the predominant relation to have with the earth. Um, you know, natural resources does not allow you to have a rock in the family. Um, you know, it precisely kind of uh, predates uh, in uh, on that um, kind of possibility. So I'm just going to wind up here um, to really kind of think about, you know, in a serious way that if we begin with inhumanity as a kind of savage form of subjectivity, that is organized as a category and thus subjugation for phenotypically designated populations through the kind of operation of race within the historical geographies of colonialism. That it determines that we start somewhere that's not predicated on, on, on the kind of immediate erasure of that um, in, in the kind of uh, organization of our political terms. Um, so one of the things that we might think about is sort of extending winter's formula formation in the Anthropocene to see a kind of introduction of man three as a kind of geologic informed subject whose life forms are coded through the inhuman, whose constituting powers are realized through the mobilization and governance of geologic materials, so minerals, geochemicals, fossil fuels, carbon, nitrogen, phosphate, uh, etc., and the accrual of geopowers as a form of settling uh, kind of uh, settler futurity. So reimagining the humanities as the inhumanities designates a field in which race and materialism are intimately tied as co-constituting discourses uh, of the kind of political figures of emergence of modernity uh, and the ongoing kind of settlement of the future in terms of its extractive uh, politics. So my own kind of um, persistence with the term of inhumanism, as well as my kind of chosen uh, sort of professorial designation in terms of inhuman geography, is precisely to work against this kind of counterintuitive um, designation of the inhuman as some, that somehow outside um, these kind of the organization of politics. And really to kind of, um, unsettle that normative working of um, and, and to think about the kind of non-normative workings um, that we might let in um, again alongside the kind of recognition and redress to the inhumane geographies um, that are the kind of legacy of extraction. So a colonial history of inhumanism that precisely generated and languished a crossing of the abysmal divide between the human and the inhuman uh, is also a new sp a space to relanguage um, a kind of a, a form and a possibility of um, understanding uh, the, the making of the earth otherwise. Um, through kind of through uh, traditions and histories uh, of uh, not just survival but um, forms of um, creative uh, innovation and theorizing in that space. So the inhumanities in its cosmic dimension of an expanding universe is deeply interested in the stretch of geophysical worlds in the making of spaces of freedom as its histories within the context of current settler colonialism and neo-extractivism sets the conditions for t thinking materially about decolonization as a geologic process. So just to kind of come back finally at kind of racial capitalism, if we see racial capitalism as organized through a particular set of historical ge geographical conditions that emerge out of an extractive psychic and material uh, set of processes that make life, that make bios, 
um, and the, how it's organized and regulated through this division with GEOS, then it's very much this juncture that needs attention as a kind of the possibility of political freedom. Thank you.